Hello and good evening, everyone. Apologies for the slight delay in starting. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And good afternoon, good evening, good day, and a general hello to everyone. Welcome to our rain round table here about curating public spaces and a happy Douglas week to you all and a happy Black History Month to everyone in the US. And I'm here with my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Dr. Adrian Mulligan. And uh, Adrian, I hand over to you. Yes, um, so thank you very much, Caroline. So this event is called Curating Public Spaces. Um, I am Dr. Adrian Mulligan. I'm one of the, the members here of, of, of Douglas Week, and thank you so much for tuning in today, also live on, on, on YouTube. Um, and thank you again to my amazing colleague, Dr. Caroline Dunham Schroeder, um, for helping to, to organize um, Douglas Week again. Um, this year. So right here, I mean, our aim with this event is obviously not only to commemorate the history of Frederick Douglass and his family um, and others, but also to discuss contemporary issues of identity and race and independence and equal rights around the world. And also to celebrate guiding uh, concepts here at Douglas Week, like connectedness, uh, co-creation, and collaboration, um, such as at this event today. And we're delighted um, to be doing exactly that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Adrian. I, I think it's it's really great and, and, and a very warm welcome to everyone here on the panel. Um, like Adrian said, you know, we have uh, a lot of things to discuss. And um, this is our second uh, annual Douglas Week, actually. And it's been uh, it's been really, really great. Last year for 2021 was our first Douglas Week. And uh, it's very important to say that, you know, while we do celebrate and commemorate Douglas, you know, the great change maker, Frederick Douglas. We also, um, you know, look at his family and we look at other change makers. And like Adrian said, um, there's so many related topics. When you start talking about Frederick Douglas, so much else comes up. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that we're really looking forward to this discussion, aren't we, Adrian? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, small items here of, of, of housekeeping. Um, First of all, the events, um, well, like all events throughout Douglas Week, these are being recorded. Uh, so if you miss an event, don't worry, all our events will be available here on YouTube. Um, and you can join us live or we watch the events during the week or afterwards, and you can find our full program um, on our website. Um, secondly, this event will last approximately one hour. Um, so we've started a little, <laughs> a little late, so sort of add an hour on. So wherever you are in the world, kind of vaguely like an hour from, from, from now, we're going to be trying to wrap things up. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please, you can submit those uh, through our chat here on, on YouTube, and we're monitoring that, and we'll pass those on to, to, to our speakers, and we're going to try to make sure that we have uh, time at the close, uh, you know, maybe the last 15 minutes or so to, to get into some of those questions, hopefully. And last but not least, uh, just please be respectful to our panelists and to other audience members. Um, obviously, inappropriate uh, conduct won't be tolerated and, um, and yeah, usual, usual stuff. So thank you, everyone, for being uh, respectful. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you um, for joining us and thank you for being respectful um, with uh, fellow audience members, but also fellow panelists. And we look very much forward to this discussion. It's going to be an exciting one. And um, I will, uh, without further ado now, hand over to uh, Adrian and our wonderful panelists, Dominique and Alex and Tonya. So great to be with you. Thank you for taking the time and being with us here and sharing your thoughts and ideas with our audiences here live on YouTube. So thank you so much and a happy Douglas week and over to you, Adrian. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. So um, today's roundtable um, is titled Curating Public Spaces, um, which hopefully sounds intriguing. Um, but we will be exploring more about what this means and how our wonderful panelists today engage with this idea and more through their own work. Um, we're going to start with a very brief introduction of our wonderful panelists. I'm going to quickly introduce them myself and then, you know, allow themselves to sort of focus and talk about them, their work and for a couple of minutes um, to introduce themselves and what they do and why they're here. Um, although obviously with, with future discussion that we're going to get into, I'm sure we'll come back to all their, their, their wonderful work. So our participants uh, include myself. Obviously, I'm I'm, I'm here. So I'm Dr. Adrian Mulligan. I'm in the Department of Geography. 
um, at Bucknell University in uh, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. I am a geographer uh, who does work on nationalism and race and gender and sexuality. Um, I explore the role that public spaces play with regards to the politics of identity and memory. I'm also a historian who tries to um, uncover marginalized and forgotten stories and places that I believe are important to remember today. Um, for example, working on the Cork Abolitionists Trail with my colleague, Dr. Lawrence Fenton and other members of, uh, of the Douglas Week team. We also have today, Dr. Tonya Matthews. She's the CEO of the new International African-American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. She's the founder of the Transformative Steminista Project, which is just amazing and just an all round inspiring activist, poet, educator, champion of diversity and, uh, and inclusion. Um, welcome, Tanya. So glad to have you here with us today. Um, we also have Dominique, uh, Jean uh, Louis. Am I saying that right, Dominique? Uh, fantastic. Um, she is a public um, historian and associate curator of history exhibitions at the New York Historical Society. Um, she's been very busy this past week preparing and opening to the public a really amazing installation and ongoing project named Our Composite Nation. Frederick Douglass, America. She's also a doctoral candidate at New York University, where she's investigating the education of Black Caribbean immigrants to the city in the post-civil rights era. And finally, last but not least, we have Alex Pentek, who is an Irish artist, uh, whose inspirational work engages with critical social issues in the public sphere. His work, for example, includes the sculptures Unity, recently unveiled in Washington, DC, in honor of Charles Hamilton. Um, Houston and Kindred Spirits in Middleton, County Cork, Ireland, which celebrates a historical bond between the Irish and Choctaw people. He's also currently studying for his Masters of Fine Arts, um, where he is exploring the ontology of the fold. So in considering our, our theme today of curating public space, um, I've done research and published on Frederick Douglass, therefore, in particular, illuminating what I believe is evidence of him being an acute reader of the spaces that he occupied. In Ireland, for example, he marveled that in public space for the first time in his life, he was uh, not experiencing the daily racism that he had previously been while living as an escaped slave and a rising abolitionist star on the speaker circuit in New England, and obviously previously as a slave in Maryland. But Douglas, I found, also shifted his arguments and his abolitionist message, depending upon the micro spatial context of the event in which he was speaking and what side of the street he was he was on pretty much. Um, this is all the more impressive, given the fact that he was in Ireland reading a very complicated and alien colonial social context in which there was more than one side of the street, so to speak with his having to navigate between different Protestant churches, for example, or crossing over to talk to Catholic audiences while in Ireland, mostly through his temperance activities. Um, we see him therefore, you know, making sure that he's talking to, to different audiences in different ways. Catholics in, in Ireland during the 19th century would have been hesitant about entering Protestant chapels um, and Quaker meeting houses as well. So Douglas was really, I think, I believe, uh, quite an active curator of public spaces himself in reading them, but also crafting and, and utilizing them expertly to convey his message in particularly powerful ways. With these also being, even in the 19th century, obviously pseudo public spaces, geographers talk about pseudo public spaces just to get us thinking about how public are they and who are the public and um, just to think about, because lots of public spaces these days are privatized, so it gets, it gets kind of tricky. Um, but Douglas, during the 19th century, I think, sort of also knew that there were different publics in Ireland, in different spaces for different publics, and he was a real expert sort of navigator of, of, of those dimensions. People have written, too, about Douglas being the most photographed man of the 19th century with his many daguerreotypes. Um, but we also see a sensibility from him in his writing, too, that he was very conscious of having to present himself in certain ways in public spaces. And as a black man and a former slave, how could he not be? But there's also a lot of agency here in his ability, I think, to read the room, to make no missteps, to stay on point and to tailor his message 
to the specific crowd in question. So anyways, our questions, our contributors uh, today also approach this theme of curating public spaces in all kinds of amazing and thoughtful and creative ways um, as we consider their potential in society to get people thinking about some very important questions, in particular with regard to race. And we've got to turn it over here now to each of them to introduce themselves in turn quickly, maybe just spend a couple of minutes each um, talking about themselves and their work before we delve into some sort of more pointed conversation and some questions and topics inspired by this theme of, of curating public spaces and what on earth that means and why it matters. So for starters, we have the wonderful Dr. Tonya uh, Matthews. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you for that. And thank you for that um, amazing uh, introduction. Uh, and even as you, you finished up your comments about um, Douglas and, and thinking about almost curating public spaces in the reverse, which is curating oneself in a public space. Uh, and that is definitely a space that I, I find myself in uh, as an African-American in some very interesting uh, different positions. I do find myself curating myself uh, in public spaces. And uh, perhaps we'll talk a bit about that as well. But as you mentioned uh, in your introduction, I am uh, currently the president and CEO of the International African American Museum. Uh, and I would call this uh, my second strikingly public space experience. Uh, just prior to the move to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, to steer this project forward, I was in Detroit, Michigan at Wayne State University, uh, which is a public university, one of the, the major large public universities uh, in Michigan, in the heart of Detroit. And so technically a public space, but is being particularly curated um, for, for students there, but as a public university in an urban space, we took some very interesting steps. Uh, in terms of thinking differently about um, our, our public space, no gates, no fences. Uh, Wayne State University is indeed a majority white uh, institution, but inside a majority black city. Um, and ostensibly it has the reputation and brand of being the people's university. So there was a lot going on there in terms of the way we thought about our public and the public space. Um, and then I'm in a very different space now uh, at the International African American Museum. We are still under construction. Uh, we should be uh, finalized uh, and opening late uh, in 2022. But the site of our museum, uh, we are built, being built upon the site of Gadsden's Wharf, uh, which is arguably one of the most prolific slave trading ports in American history. Uh, and so we're building a museum there to commemorate that story, but as well as sort of the full scope, as much as one can do in 100,000 square feet. Um, of the African-American journey. And so it's very interesting to be curating a public space that itself has a really storied history. Uh, and different segments of the public um, will have different relationships to that history. Everything from, from sadness to resistance, to joy, to frankly flat out denial, uh, to surprise, um, and so it's very interesting to be building in that space. Uh, and the last thing I will say, because it'll come up, I think, in our later discussion, is that even as museums, even public and, and open museums are thought of as public spaces, at the end of the day, we are public spaces curated by private entities. Uh, one, way, one way or another, however you want to sort of um, expand those, those definitions. So we have, obviously, we, we open the doors, we close the doors, we choose the exhibits, we control the narrative uh, inside uh, of, of those spaces and, and have um, really strong opportunities to direct the learning and experience journey. And if we're smart, we do that with and in community. So, of course, the International African American Museum does have that. But actually, we also have a large exterior space under and surrounding the building as well. We have a memorial garden space that um, uh, puts right up against uh, the harbor. 
that space is fully open to the public, almost like a public park. Uh, and so thinking about how we, how we welcome folks into that space um, and the limitations of curation in an authentically uh, public space. We can guess where our visitors will go. We can attempt to guide. But at the end of the day, a truly public space is ultimately uh, the experience in that is ultimately curated by the public itself. Uh, and so um, I'll be happy to uh, to get into that conversation uh, with my colleagues as this talk goes on. Wonderful. Thank you, Tanya. You know, I was looking at your fantastic design and thinking that you're you're unfortunately sort of climate change um, ready um, as well with 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 your your space, and that's something else as we try to think about um, histories and coastal histories, especially how difficult it's 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 going to be with with some of the changes we've got coming at us. But that, that's it's another topic for another day, perhaps. So moving on here to uh, to, to to Dominique. Um, and Dominique, if uh, you're able to also just sort of tell us a little bit more about yourself and your, your, your wonderful work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. And thank you both uh, for having me, Adrian, and um, to the whole team at Douglas Week. And also thanks for that grounding, uh, Tanya. I think that's <laughs> such an important kickoff to our conversation. And I'm really glad that I get to follow up and I'm just um, so excited for this museum to open. And so I'm just excited. <laughs> To talk with you today, but it's fitting given that, um, you know, your museum is about to open. It will be the newest museum in Charleston, at least for a time. And I'm coming here from or representing the New York Historical Society, which is the oldest museum in New York, mm -hmm. uh, which has long been a museum destination. And I think, I don't think the way we think about public space is necessarily different, but I think history informs so much about how public space works and how we can work within it because one of the things that's so important to think about apologize for the motorcycle noise that's new york city on a nice 60 degree day on the weekend but um you know not only are you thinking carefully about who has access to what spaces and whose voice is represented in those spaces um but also that sometimes the limitations predate you or sometimes the conceptions predate you so while i'm in the position the incredibly lucky in a uh, position I'm grateful for to be able to do curation work at the New York Historical Society, rethinking and um, stewarding conversations through new scholarly interpretations of people like Douglas. Um, her exhibition that we just opened, uh, our composite nation, Frederick Douglass's America, looks at Douglas in the moment of reconstruction a few years after the Civil War ends. And that in and of itself, I think, is one of the important ways museums can serve to introduce a wider public to a maybe a more narrow story. I think in as much as people, the general public knows about Frederick Douglass, they know about his past as an enslaved person, they know about his career as an abolitionist, but a large part of his career took place well after slavery ends and he's now thinking through what America will be, including what its spaces are, what its conversations will be, and helping people understand that aspect of Douglas and the new scholarship that supports that view um, is something we get to do. However, I can't, I mean, I've been at the New York Historical Society five years. I can't just come in and say, this is who we are now. This is what you can expect to see now. This is the kind of person that we're hoping to reach because our institution opened in 1804. It is not I, I can endeavor to do as much as possible to open up that space, to introduce new kinds of conversations that haven't happened there, to um, you know propose new kinds of history. But these um, institutions, and I, I love your phrasing, Tanya, of public spaces curated by public uh, by private entities, public spaces curated by private entities, because you know while we are a public space in many ways, and we're certainly publicly funded in many ways it is still one perspective that is limited. Yeah. Of course it's limited. And so um, in any case, that so much of our work is doing the rigorous, rigorous job of bringing the highest quality history to as many people as we can, but that's never just happening, you know, in its own realm, you know, in a free way. You're always thinking about what has the history of this institution been? Um, where is it located in the city and how do those things um, contribute to what publics we are expecting to come. And as we are extending invitations to a wider public, 
what are the limitations that um, exist because of that history, because of this location, because of, as you mentioned, Tanya, the very architecture and structure of the building, it's, you know, distance from the subway or its accessibility in certain ways. All of these are questions that um, museums think about very carefully as we're trying to bring important content to public content to public audiences. So, so much of this we, we stand to have a fantastic conversation about. Um, I'll leave it there, but very grateful to be here and in conversation with all of you today. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dominique. Um, so much for we're gonna get back to one little tidbit of stuff that I know I'm gonna forget unless I get it out and somebody maybe remembers it or it might just disappear. But I was thinking that you mentioned how, you know, Douglas was so many people and so much of what he did, he did sort of later. And that's something as we would try to remember for Douglas, and you probably grapple with this too, is you want to remember the, the whole man and he's amazing and he did so much. But also too, when you think about him in his 20s, he was still figuring things out and he was different then than he was later. And if anything, it sort of makes him more sort of approachable or personable or more useful historically by focusing on him sort of composite parts or him still trying to figure it out anyway. It's, it's, it might be a random thought. It's something we can maybe come back to later or not. So without further ado here, gonna pop over to, to, to Alex um, Pentec. Um, and Alex, if you're able to sort of talk to us a little bit about just who you are and, and the sure. wonderful work that you also do. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. Thanks, Adrian. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be here. And I really can't wait for the uh, chats and the conversation uh, afterwards and during all of this with, with all of you. Um, and thanks to everyone for tuning in as well. So I'm going to just click on some images, uh, which I hope you can see. I'm not sure if I'm clicking too fast here. Yeah. OK, so first image I, I'd like to show you very quickly. I'm going to just talk about some of the work that I do and put my hand up firstly and to say I am not a Frederick Douglass scholar, unfortunately. Um, but as an artist, I've worked uh, internationally in, in gallery, making gallery work and also international sort of, you know, public realm work, uh, about 30 large scale works. And so we're going to look just at two of these projects uh, for the time being, but I'm starting with the work by Martin Perrier at the 2019 Venice Biennale, um, column for Sally Hemings. Um, who, as um, most of you will know, um, was a black African woman, um, technically owned by Thomas Jefferson as a slave, and who bore him five children. And this is uh, this piece by Martin Perrier uh, depicts a sort of shackle iron spike embedded into a, a marble column in the atrium of the um, American Pavilion, which is actually modeled architecturally from Thomas Jefferson's neoclassical mansion, Monticello, in Charlottesville, Virginia. So the sort of the levels of wrongness uh, and the sort of what, what Martin Perrier is, is sort of addressing in this work are just off the charts. And so there's a connection to Douglas, I think, through some of the themes that I've happened to work on and, and wanted to kind of bring in with this particular piece, um, which comes actually um, uh, quite, quite evenly onto um, the Colston um, uh, statue um, being removed in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so, you know, we saw this happen around the world. Uh, and this is a real tale of allyship here where public spaces are being claimed. I think this really is relevant to, uh, to our discussion you know, who owns public spaces and who has the right of control of public spaces. So we'll, I look forward to coming back to that. Um, but, you know, just th these events set in chain um, things in motion that are just, uh, uh, you know, th didn't just happen last year because um, of, of, you know, because of Mr. Floyd's murder. Um, they're sort of, a lot of these statues were wanted, you know, were, sort of wanted to be removed a long time before um, last year, before 2020. So, um, you know, it, it sort of brought things to a head, I think. Um, then after this, this particular statue was removed, um, um, there was the, the image of this woman who stood in defiance and, and worked with artist Mark Quinn, who actually made a lifelike replica of her in resin. And um, so she's Jen Reed. And so this is a temporary piece. They did not seek permission from the authorities to put this in place. 
they just did it. I think, I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was a temporary work just to put in place to sort of, you know, to make a comment. Um, so the, the first of two projects I'm going to very quickly talk about are this first piece that Adrian mentioned very kindly earlier, uh, Kindred Spirits, which remembers the 1847 donation to Ireland by the Choctaw First Nation uh, American Indians. And so, um, you know, this is an amazing act of humanity. And looking into the histories um, uh, of the First Nation um, people, and there's the work being made here actually, and you can see behind me in the backdrop, I'm here in the National Sculpture Factory, which is a large um, art making facility in the city of Cork, Ireland. So, um, I wanted to respond to, I think, really the humanity of the story and, and the fact that actually between the Trail of Tears, you know, where thousands died from, you know, um, exposure and starvation, and then, of course, the, 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 the history of the famine, um, where a million perished from starvation, it's just, I found it to actually be unimaginable and that certain histories are unimaginable. So I wanted to kind of symbolize the humanity through this work, which is symbolic of an empty bowl fused with the round-tipped eagle feathers used in Choctaw ceremonial dress. And Chief Batten very kindly attended the launch ceremony uh, with members of the council and um, spoke about the piece, not just reflecting this history, and this is a theme maybe that we can return to as well, but while it, it does, you know, I made the piece in response to a specific history, the 1847 Choctaw donation, or the gift as the Choctaw uh, call it, um, it also speaks to standing together against um, uh, adversity and oppression. And these images were taken, uh, this image was taken by Brian Martin with a drone, uh, some drone footage, just showing it lit up at night. So that's Kindred Spirits. I'm doing a whistle stop here, so sorry if I'm moving too quickly. The next piece I wanted to very quickly talk about was inspired by this man, Charles Hamilton Houston, who, as we know, almost single-handedly dismantled the Jim Crow laws of racist segregation in the States. And researching his life and achievements, and that was, that was the task, it was an international competition for artists to respond and to reflect his achievements. And I found this quote um, where he served as a first, um, uh, sorry, a second lieutenant field gunner in the First, and, uh, first World War. And uh, here he says, the hate and scorn showered on his Negro officers by our fellow Americans convinced me that there was no sense in my dying for a world ruled by them. I made up my mind that if I got through the war, I would study law and, fight my and, and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. So these are very, very powerful words. And reading between these lines, I realized that while he must have been in absolute hell, not only in France and Germany during the first heavily industrialized war, um, but also experiencing this sort of racism um, and, and um, oppression, um, but yet he still hoped for integration, for, for, for education, you know, that he was hopeful, you know, despite all of this. And so Unity is the title I gave this piece, and I discovered that actually the allium flower in floriography symbolizes not only unity, but also staying true to one's principles. That was the computer montage that I created, and this is the actual work in place in Washington, D.C. And I'll just move very quickly on to get a bit closer to give you a, a better look. So looking at the allium flower, I actually divided the surface into a mathematical series of six and five sided flowers uh, with a, an underlying geometry of an isosahedron. But really what I wanted to do was communicate the idea of a globe and of unity and of connectedness and that ultimately that that our children will, will inherit the earth, you know, and, and the, the, the world belongs to them ultimately. So um, these are just some images taken by Don Gregory, the uh, building architect, and uh, that's all I have to show um, on that. Um, so um, I finished with a quote by Albert Camus, uh, talking about the procedure of art being the same as the procedure of rebellion, which is to resist the real while conferring unity upon it. And I think this perhaps relates to um, Frederick Douglass in that by you know, um, mentioning rebellion here and the procedure of rebellion um, and, and to resist the real um, isn't just tearing it all up and, and destroying everything. It's not waving the black flag of anarchy. It's, it's taking down what needs to come down and rebuilding. And, and this idea of kind of conferring unity is, is what um, I like to try to do with, with my work. So that's just from my, my perspective as an artist working on two of these projects. And I'm going to see if I can just stop sharing now. 
and come back to our screens again. So that's me. So I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so in the context of Douglas Week here, we're obviously thinking about the legacy of Frederick Douglass and abolitionism, of activating this history in the present as a unifying inspirational platform, but also thinking about this uh, beyond opening up new spaces metaphorically to challenge discriminatory ideas of race and gender and sexuality, for example, but also trying to think about how this can happen in, in real spaces, for example, public spaces, and considering the role that they can play in anti-racist and broader social justice struggles. So considering this dynamic of public space and society and its role and potential raises further questions, for example, which I think all of our um, panelists today have begun to, to, to talk about. These questions involve things like, you know, who are the public and who gets to, de to define the public and what is in their or in our interest? Um, what kinds of public spaces are we talking about? Are there even truly public spaces that include everybody, or is that an illusion? Um, if there are public spaces, how do they matter? Um, what are the politics of these public places in different contexts? Um, what different ways are there in which we might curate public space? And is curating even possible, or is that the, the wrong word? Perhaps alternatively, we need to engage or intervene or challenge or juxtapose or educate or imagine or dream. So I've got a, questions here, therefore. This first question is, is, is kind of just to, to all uh, panelists in general, and we can sort of just unpack it and talk about it. And then I've got some more questions that we can sort of aim at, at, at individual folks. But this thinking here about just something just here for, for, for all of you, for anybody just to, to chime in. Um, so in my academic discipline of geography, for example, we consider how uh, subjectivities such as race uh, are not just socially, but also spatially constructed and how public space acts as an arena in which dominant norms can be enforced and reproduced by powerful groups. But there's also, you know, it's also an arena too of resistance and of, of agency. Um, furthermore, we can think about all spaces as processes. Um, they're never complete. Uh, place is the product of uh, interconnectivity. It's always shifting. It's always becoming. Um, and by doing this, we're able to sort of think about the power that folks might have to territorialize and maybe to also, you know, intervene or to create public space to challenge um, ideas. So I'm wondering, therefore, if, if you might be willing to, to help us to think more about what kinds of public spaces we're talking about in this regard. How do we think about the potential of public space and what that potential is exactly to do to do what? Some pretty crazy questions, but but yeah. but hopefully we'll making something. some sense. Big questions. But um, I, I I'd love to jump in and kind of to start um, pointing us in some directions. There, I think um, thinking about public space both very abstractly but also very literally. So um, even just today, before um, uh, uh, coming to this panel, I was out taking a walk. I live very close to Central Park, which is right where our museum is located and especially on a nice day today where the you know the, the, the sun is shining and everyone's out you kind of can't help thinking about right remind yourself this is occupied land right this land did not always be this land was not always central park and specifically the part of the park i was in and the part our museum is located on before it was Central Park was Seneca Village, which was a neighborhood occupied by both um, Irish immigrants and also African-American free black people living side by side in a neighborhood that was raised and you know broken down to create Central Park. This idea that public space for everybody is more important than you, your, li your livelihood and what you've built for yourself, your homes, your churches, your barbershops, et cetera. So that's that legacy that most people walking around, there's some lovely stanchions around in the park now that talk a little bit more about the story. Those are maybe a year or two old. So for, you know, the, you know, more than a century of Central Park's history, that is seen as public space that's open for everybody. But the history of what it took to create that public space is obscured. And then, of course, before there's even a Seneca village, this is all native land that you know was not seeded, was not sold in in a way that really um, fully transfers ownership. That we are indeed were then and still are occupying that land. So, thinking about a museum space that sits on top of two you know subsumed histories, I think 
power and public space are always intimately connected. It's just our role as curators and as stewards of that history. And I appreciate your um, gesture towards Adrian, you know, as curate even the word, you mentioned dream, educate. Of course, curate comes from the Latin word curare, which is to cure, you know, to heal, to care for. Um, part of that healing, part of that care needs to be in revealing that history, not just let's create space for people to come together and for these stories to be told, but in fact, by let's reveal what this space means now, what it has meant, um, you know, what it what it will potentially mean in the future and how we all have stakes in that. I think I, speaking specifically about a history museum, a history library and a museum, um, that is not just a interesting facet of what I do. I actually consider it pretty central to the work of any historian is to um, reveal those kinds of histories so that people are armed with the information they need to fully consider where they sit um, in terms of space and in terms of history, right? Um, I don't think it ruins anyone's day to go out on rollerblades in Central Park and know that they're on native land, that they're on land that was cleared of people to create this public space. I think you can still have a great time rollerblading, but also understand the history and where you sit in relation to that. So as both historians and people who are creating public spaces, I think those layers are so important to reveal so that we can do our job responsibly and um, you know offer people a little bit more uh, depth and context as they go about their lives and as well as hopefully learn something in these spaces that we create. Absolutely. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah, I'm thinking too, I mean, obviously, you know this in 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 New York City, I mean, you've got that history of Olmsted and, and the park and, and who that was designed for and the public. And these battles obviously continue into the present day. So we think about Bryant Park, we think about gentrification, as we think about parks being locked up at night, as we think about homeless people and anti-homeless benches and who can use parks and who can't use parks. And I was thinking as well, too, Tanya, you, you know, mm -hmm. as we think about Gadsden's Wharf, um, it's, yeah, I and mean, you've got some serious gentrification there right up to that site too. And you know, to some people, it's almost like a blank slate because they don't know what what, what happens there. You know, which is just so messed up. You've got like you know, ground zero of of, of just complete horror and a main point of of disembarkation of slaves, and yeah. and you've got to to summon that up. You know. Um, yeah, I, and I think, you know, and I, I loved uh, sort of Dominique's uh, point where, you know, there's 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 the long story uh, and then there's the, the more, more even more recent story, as you pointed out, with the gentrification, um, the area of, of Charleston, uh, the peninsula downtown Charleston, where we sit, used to be a majority black neighborhood, right? It, it had sort of sort of those um those 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 churches those homes but this is this is also the low country right this is this is south carolina we're not just building where people's homes used to be we're building over graveyards um we're building sort of over all of those kinds of things and i think one of the things that i've been thinking about is um you know the the illusion um that say to uh return the space to an institution that honors the space that's the question. Is that enough? Okay, we're sorry. We realize what happened here. This was the site. Great. We'll build. We'll build a museum that that talks about this story. Is that enough? Um, and I think that that opens the door. Um, but I think that the way we construct uh, those those spaces, very much like the quote um, from from Houston that that Alex used, it's actually about then then can we make a move sort of to to shift? So if we can bring up, for example, the first slide that I had with the water, and I can give you an example of what this sort of looks like in our space, right? Okay, so um, this is a, a view from uh, from one of our, our the staircases, sort of the, the harbor side facing staircase of the museum, right? It's this, this outside space. This is, this is all ours. I mean, technically we don't have fences and technically it's open to the public, but we've got our infinity reflection pool there that you're seeing. So two things um, to, to point out here. Right, um, which is one, yes, we're the site of Gadsden's War, the site of massacre, the site of enslavement, the site of unconceivable um, horrors that 
someone was able to conceive of, and that's how they happen. And as you're looking at our infinity reflection pool, the images uh, in that pool were designed with the inspiration of the, the Brookings um, drawings of how um, enslaved peoples are packed into the bottom of, of boats, right? So that's one of the, the, um, the inspirations behind that. The other inspirations are in conversation with, with the water, right? So it's, it's solemn, it's, it's sad, it's reflective. But to your question around what can public spaces do and what can the public do in those spaces, do you see the little girl that's walking in the pool? And it was so funny. I laughed when I saw this and I literally said, you know people are going to walk through our pool, right? You you do know people are going to walk through our pool. Um, and the, the the designer said we should put up a sign that says "Don't walk in the pool." I'm like first of all, that that that's not going to help. Have you met Have you met people? Have you met people? They're they're going to walk. They're going to walk in the pool. But that actually called a question. So for example, when I mean what we can do by the spaces, technically we are quote unquote protectors of the space. We could put a sign up that says don't walk into this pool, which by the way is only like an inch or so deep. And then we would actually have the right to remove people from the site if they walked through the pool. We might even have the right to, to call for people to be arrested uh, for walking uh, through the pool uh, in that space. And our decision to do so or not to do so is also about reclaiming the space, right? And so that's where our responsibility is uh, in that, to choose not to do that, right? Um, to, to think differently about that. But the second part of that, and why I love this particular rendering is, it's a child um, and I'm looking at the hair, so I'm just gonna guess. And let's say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a black and brown child that is walking uh, in that space. And that is the pure embodiment of joy. And so we have this space and we reclaim this space. We're not just reclaiming this space for old memories. We're also trying to reclaim this space in honor of the joy that was able to survive and come from this space. And that's part of what the public can do. That, that's part of what, if you, if you are sort of in conversation with, with the public and the way that humans will be humans, I think that ultimately also has a, a big implication for how we think about public spaces and their potential and what we want them to do. Wonderful, thank you, Tanya. Bring Alex in here as well. I mean, amazing um, presentation, uh, Tanya. <laughs> Great words to. Uh, can I respond to something to, 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 to part of that? If that's okay. Please, if please. You, um, so, you know, I, I, I'm just. It's so. It's so interesting and so relevant and so important. These ideas. You asked, what can public spaces do, and. You know, like looking at, say, some of the writing of Hannah Arendt, um, where she looked at, you know, she's the, the famous post-war um, 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 social um, sort of um, theorist. She didn't call herself a philosopher, although some do consider her that. Um, but, you know, before, we, before going any further, I think there are two things that maybe we could think about, and that is public spaces that we're, we're talking about. And we're talking about institutions, and we're talking about histories, and we're talking about events. And I wonder, is it possibly helpful to broaden that to being the public sphere, as opposed to a physical space? Because public sphere, of course, includes public space, but it includes everything else as well. And thinking of public sphere, um, I think there are maybe two dimensions. So there's the, the dimension of space of appearance, you know, where citizens act in concert through the medium of speech, as Hannah Arendt would say, and, and persuasion and, you know, interacting with one another. And then the second aspect of the, of the public sphere is the common world, a shared public world of human artifacts, institutions, uh, settings, which separates us from nature and provides durable and permanent context for act, our activities. These are just some notes that I was reading um, from my own so maybe that's helpful in thinking um, just in terms of those two differences of physical space and then a sort of more the public sphere as a, as a, as a, a, a place um, that involves all our history and institutions. Um, and coming back to um, Arendt, um, she says to answer the, you know, the, or to, 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 to kind of explore that question of what can public spaces do, she says that um, 
you know, our citizenship actually rests within the public space, that um, our, our idea, her idea of citizenship is, is participatory uh, in that we can address questions of collective identity and political agency through public spaces. And by entering uh, into a course of action, we enter a sort of claim on behalf of we and a collective form of identity. And the, 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 the perform a performative engagement um, with, um, with viewers and audiences to create this new collective identity and a, a legacy of shared experience. So I think this is something that we all seem to be kind of just naturally talking about together uh, already. We're very much on the same page here, it, it seems. And Arendt says that the value of citizenship um, rests in its ability to create new forms of collective identity that can be acknowledged and transformed in a democratic and discursive way. Um, so that's maybe relevant to, to, to what we're looking at already, but also she kind of says quite perceptibly um, well, that, that, you know, talk about voice um, and, and agency. Um, she says that with identity can follow political uh, agency, but that we have to find our voices first before we can have political agency. Um, you know, we have to sort of, um, learn how to speak almost before we can actually go and actually you know say something so about finding voice first um, before we can collectively get together um, she's very much a a sort of fan of speech and voice and using our voice and believes that our voices and our actual behavior is very much controlled normally in public spaces you know we can't do this we can't you know, there are sort of lots of unspoken rules, lots of written rules as well. Um, some for very good reason, I suppose, but just the fact that public spaces are always controlled, uh, like Dominique mentioned as well. So these are just some thoughts, sorry. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's actually really good because it's making me think in terms of, you know, when, um, you know, when, when Dominique um, describes, you know, being in a, a hundred year sort of, you know, historical kind of, kind of space, part of me was like, yeah, then folks would know they have a problem. <laughs> sort of in that, it gives you a physical thing to sort of reach back to and say, okay, listen, we clearly know that our history is long enough um, without sometimes, you know, there's a slippery slope to, well, we weren't here then, right? We are the brand new uh, kind of world order. And I'm being very conscious of that because we're, we're still um, to, um, to Alex's point, in the sphere of museums. Just because our museum is about to be brand new, the centuries old traditions of museums are part of what people are going to bring to our space. And we've got to be very, I think, deliberate in acknowledging that and, and calling that out. There's a young woman who's working on some of the, the construction side of, of our space. And I'd asked if she knew what space she was building. She didn't. And I gave her a little quick little tour. You know, she looks like me, it was great. And then I said, well, this is great. What are your favorite museums? And she said, I've never been to a museum. Can't wait to come to this one. <sighs> But as I probed and I talked, there were there were reasons, just as Alex sort of mentioned, these these unspoken norms that that happen in these spaces. And to Dominique's um, point, the way that the spaces have been telling their stories didn't really sort of resonate. So all of that, we all of that comes to us, um, and I think we have to be conscientious about it. Um, I don't know if we have to deliberately confront it or not. Still working on that. But, you know, I, I, I really resonate with this sort of public sphere um, that Alex was, was referencing because we're not isolated and we're really connected to, to all of our, our history in this space. If I could just actually respond right to that, Tanya, and thank you so much for pulling that together and, um, and sharing that anecdote, especially about the way that confronting legacy and trying to build for the future are right up against each other sometimes. Um, and both of what you said, Alex, and, and you, Tanya, is so perfectly aligned with the idea of Douglas Week or thinking about Douglas, because one of the things I was so struck by curating a show that centers one of his speeches is thinking about how much he was beyond just someone who gave speeches, right? He is someone who I think very relevant to someone who does history in a museum as opposed to writing books or, you know, um, it only existing in, in academia, so to speak, is that 
you're trying to meet people where they are with the learning style that they have. And so someone like Frederick Douglass, who I think never referred to himself as a curator, was doing that work too, because he's traveling the country on whistle stop tours, giving speeches, but then he's also returning home and feverishly turning out news articles for people to hold in their hands and read. He's also, I think, um, Adrian, you mentioned, very specifically and intentionally making sure he's photographed, making sure he's only photographed in particular ways because he understands that the medium of photography is another way to storytell. And um, I'll very briefly share the story. It's when I give off when I talk about museums. I started out as like a museum teaching fellow as a doctoral student, like, oh, maybe I'll like learn a little bit about museums. And it changed my life quite literally because, you know, I'm used to history classes. I passed my comprehensive exams. I think I know U.S. history. And then they send you up in a museum gallery with a dozen kids to the Bronx. And they don't give one hoot about how well I know the information. Um, it's how am I presenting? And if I'm not interesting, they're physically going to walk away. They're going to wander the gallery, all of this. And so my job is actually not know the information, have a perfect sense of the dates and the times. It's actually, how do I tell a compelling story? And it matters that we're in a museum. I'm not standing in front of a classroom. We have to make this visual. It is a fact that most people are visual learners. And I think the three of us are all engaged in not just storytelling and creating public spaces, but ones that are specifically visual, um, or at least specifically think about different kinds of learning styles that encompass visual um, you know, learners, as well as people who learn from hearing things, as well as people who learn from kinesthetically from actually doing something, so giving them a task to do. Um, so much of creating public spaces and thinking through public spaces is this constant question. I'm wondering if the two of you ask yourselves this or if this question guides you in your work as much as, as, much as it does me, are we meeting people where they are, right? If we are creating something wonderful that no one can access, we're doing a bad job no matter how hard we're working. And so part of public space is also, you know, thinking carefully about who that audience is, but also, you know, accessibility in every definition of that word. Um, and I think Frederick Douglass is such a, even more so now that I've gotten to know so much more about his life, is such a North Star of like, if you if you only will make change by reading, I got, I got something for you to read. If you only make change by listening, I got something for you to hear. If you only make change by seeing it in front of you, boy, have I got a visual for you. The sense of I have one life and I'm going to use literally every tool I have access to to get my meaning across. Um, I think in many ways, Douglas was the most successful curator out there, especially to think of now online, you know, we have so many more tools and how are we making use of them to get a point across? You know, it's so interesting to, to think about this question of trust, I think, and getting the public to, to trust us in public space as we educate. I just, I grapple with this as, as an educator, albeit it's sort of private liberal arts university um, with a certain kind of, of, of students, but also in a university that's trying to diversify too and thinking about different learning styles, but also thinking about my, my different students and how I have to reach them differently by you know, acknowledging my, my whiteness, for example, and, and putting that out there and trying to get my other students as well to, to think about themselves as having racial identities, perhaps in ways that they, they mightn't have done previously, while also at the same time, realizing that this generation can't listen to me talk for more than five minutes without needing a video or needing something else. And that's fine. That's just how we have to do things these days. So, so yeah, no, these are, these are wonderful sort of ways of thinking about how we sort of earn the, the, the trust of our audiences and where we meet people. Um, and Hannah Arendt's stuff too, Alex, that's, I'm thinking that, you know, here we are on YouTube, you know, the, a new institution, you know, does public, we're talking about does public space matter and we're not even in, we're in the cyber world right but now. This but is a public sphere. This is a well. public sphere. <laughs> public sphere, isn't it? And it's, Here we it, are. You know, yeah. but then there's questions of geographical access in terms of, of who has a computer and who can see us and who can sit down and, yeah. and, and then you begin to get maybe a little bit more geographical with it. But this has been something wonderful with Douglas Week, weirdly through the pandemic is, we've reached more people, I think, in some ways by being forced to go this, this particular route, you know, or maybe we've reached different kinds of people. I don't know. So, so no, these are, these are wonderful, um, 
wonderful questions to ask. So some more questions here. We're, we're going to keep on. Everything's overlapping, I know, and it's 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 fantastic. So this is for Danya and for Tanya and for Dominique. Um, so Douglas Week uh, obviously attempts to bring together different social justice groups on a platform that is not contained by nation state borders, for example, which attempts to historicize and internationalize anti-racism struggles. Um, through our involvement in this Douglas Week event, therefore today, but also in our respective fields in different ways, we seem to be challenging dominant narratives in their spatial framing. But how do we recover and challenge while also being inclusive? Is that even possible? You know, as we as we try to wake people up to things that happened on, on Gadsden's Wharf, how do we not preach to the choir? How do we bring other people in in a way that's that's upsetting, that's that's challenging? You know, this is this this balance with with heritage and with tourism. Um, I, you know, you, you know this in the, the the big plantation houses outside of Charleston when you when you go for a visit and you know you can sort of cherry pick different parts of the tour. You want to go to the big house, or you want to go to see the, the the pelicans, or you want to do the gardens, or do you want to do all of it? You know, and you're standing there in line, and people are like, "Well, I'll do the big house, and we'll do the pelicans," and you're like, "You're gonna miss out on the slavery stuff." It's like, "Well, that's an extra ten bucks." I don't know if I want to do that. So, how do you get everybody? How do you get everybody in? How do you challenge while also staying afloat, literally, as, as, as an institution? You know, as we think about needing private money, um, how do you walk that line? You know, I think it's a, it's a very good um, question. And I think part of it is around really understanding um, the, what inclusion actually means, right? Inclusion is the epitome of part of this argument of equality versus equity, right? So, so depending on, on your socialization perspective, let me be gentle, your socialized perspective, inclusion may be, all right, I get to talk 25% of the time, you get to talk 25% of the time, we don't break it up between these other four people, good, boom, 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 we all get to talk for the same amount of time, we all get to say, you know, what we want. That's not actually what inclusion means. Inclusion is a very complicated and very nuanced um, kind of thing. So for example, some, some really good um, level setting phrases I've heard recently, or you come into a group and say, you know, one of our rules is we do not argue with lived experiences. Boom. Okay, you may be the exception to the rule, you may be a classic statistic, you may whatever, whatever your story is, we do not argue sort of with, with lived experiences. And I think it's it's around thinking through, through those things and it is unbelievably hard. However, having non-inclusive conversations about how the world needs to change is not really gonna help. <laughs> It is, it's, it's not really, it, it's not really, while it may be um, rejuvenating, um, which we do need times uh, for, for that, it might be um, help to solidify the language. Um, and we, we do need to do that. But putting people with the same perspective in a room to discuss the most challenging problems can do a lot of things. But move the dial is, is not one of them. And so I think that we need to think about how we go into and out of spaces that both reflect us um, and, and don't reflect us. And so I'll give sort of a kind of a concrete, uh, you know, example, you know, when we talk about whether or not you can have, say, white docents in black first voice spaces, right? Is that appropriate? You know, should, should we be doing that, et cetera? And, and my response to that is, it's a really interesting question because it's, it depends on whether or not you are committed to developing the skill set and the empathy levels required to do so. Because you haven't asked me, um, does an African American woman have the right to represent in white spaces? Obviously, yes, I do constantly because of the level I'm at, but there's a skill set to it, there's a level of empathy to it. And so it really is kind of in that space that I'm committed to sort of learning the, the skills and to sort of being able to read the room and sort of do all of those, those things. And now that we're, we're giving language to it, it is just as fraught. I know it seems harder in the other way around, but it is, it is just as fraught, I think, on, on both sides. And so I, I do think that it's, it's important 
but I, I'm kind of on the side of yeah, it's going to have to be challenging, and, and we, we we do need sort of diverse folks uh, in in the room. But uh, inclusion is is not always um, inclusion is not straightforward. Um, it's it's very complicated, which is actually part of why it's so powerful. This is why we love the artists, which is Alex. Can you give us another another way into these conversations in the public space. Um, you know, um, they allow us to sort of you know bring different people together. Almost, I don't know coming out of left field or a bit of a bait and switch or, or, or sort of just, you're still engaging with the problematic stuff, but you're, you're engaging with it differently. I think in a way that is sort of incredibly useful, you know, in ways that me being in the classroom or um, working in a museum, that, that it, you, you're coming at it, you can talk about this better than I can. You're coming at it in a really sort of important sort of integrative and, and sort of powerful manner, I think, to bring together divided communities who might not be brought together in a museum necessarily or in a classroom, you know? That's, um, yeah, hopefully true. Um, um, definitely, I mean, like the art, from, from, I can only speak really from my perspective as a visual artist um, who predominantly makes sculpture. Uh, and folded um, paper works as well, origami inspired works. But there's a couple of things that I want to bring in. Uh, so first thing, language. Um, Tanya, you mentioned language. Um, it's a problem. And as I'm studying at the moment, um, Adrian, yeah. you, you mentioned, I'm mm -hmm. studying it for a, a, an MFA in art in the contemporary world at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. And so I'm in my final semester now, actually, so the pressure's on. But um, part of last year, we did a lot of theoretical reading, and there's an emphasis on the course on critical writing, critical thinking. And um, part of my own journey has looked at the work of Wittgenstein, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was a sort of famous uh, 20th century Austrian philosopher, who basically ripped up philosophy in, in 1921, said basically he's finished it. He, 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 he basically said that the problem, um, to, to kind of say it very boldly and, and, and you know, brashly, is, is language, to start from a mistrust of language, and that it's almost like we're trapped in a bottle, and the only way out of that bottle is to use, unfortunately, grammar and language. <laughs> so we have to climb this ladder to escape, but then throw away the ladder at the last minute. And, you know, he, he mentions um, language being inherently oppositional, but also he touches on something you mentioned, Dominique, in that language that he, he says predominantly we, we're visual creatures um, when, when, whenever that's possible, of course, you know, obviously if we have a pair of working eyes that helps. Um, but to speak and to communicate visually, we use language then to give pictures uh, into each other's, you know, we put a picture into someone else's mind, they put a picture back into our mind through language, and that we exchange those pictures mentally. And miscommunications happen when those pictures don't match. So he comes from a mistrust of language, which is, I think, really, really healthy. Um, but coming on to what you mentioned there, um, uh, Adrian, about um, trans, you know, interdisciplinary sort of approaches, um, I'm also artist in residence at the moment with um, the design pedagogy and praxis uh, course in University College Cork with Dr. Bryony Supple and um, with fellow artists as well, Caroline Connolly. And so we are looking at the design course from an artist's perspective. And there's a wonderful thing I think happening that I'm sure you're all aware of as well at third level at the moment is a shift from the sort of dendritic central knowledge branching out from the from the person who knows it all and then disseminating that knowledge to the, to the people who don't know as much perhaps, to a different model where it's basically transdisciplinary. So, um, you know, you get this where you have a team of people who are now are looking at a specific topic together as equals uh, with various roles of expertise that they can bring to the conversation. And then that then is the sort of, is the medium to, to discover and learn as a group that's not centralized, so more transdisciplinary. 
Yeah. And we've been using that, and I've been using actually folded paper and origami as a model for that in various settings, you know, from engineering to architecture to robotics. And it's been brilliant fun. We're having, we're having good fun with it. Fantastic. But I think that that can be a way to come back to the question that Tonya raised about how do you engage with people? Um, and I think it, it, it relates to something that Ernst Gombrich, who was an art critic of the mid 20th century, and he says, he mentions a thing called the beholder's share, you know, the, 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 the beholder being the person who is looking at the artwork. And he says that basically we bring our beholder's share, we bring our own baggage, right? We bring our own life experience. And like you say, Tonya, no one is qualified to say that's invalid, right? No one can say, no, you're wrong, uh, actually. <laughs> you know, that's not what this artist was thinking. You know, if you have a reaction, mm -hmm. and I'm a great believer in this, I'm a great believer in people, um, that when we see things, re we react intellectually, but before we've reacted intellectually and consciously even, you know, we've already reacted emotionally. You know, they say 90% of communication is nonverbal. You know, when you meet someone new for the first time, you're kind of judging their body language and it's all, you know, we're, we're gauging one another like this on this very intuitive level. And I think we're doing this all the time. We can't stop. And so um, this is a wonderful way in, I think, to sort of be aware of these things and to communicate sort of more fully uh, on an emotional level and on this sort of intuitive level. And, and it also kind of recalls Roland Barthes, um, who the, the literary crit critic, uh, French literary critic, uh, mid 20th century, again, 50s, um, and his paper, The Death of the Author, right? Famous piece, where he says, basically, once a piece of literature is written, the author may as well be dead. Because when, when, the, when the person is reading that, then they're reinventing it new. It, it becomes new for that person as we read the, the, the thing, the novel or the history. And history, particularly, that's, uh, you know, now, now it's becoming relevant because history, um, like uh, Camille Desmoulins famously said on his way to having his head chopped off, having instigated partly the, the French Revolution, um, he said, uh, was it something like, all of history is fiction, translating into something like that. And I think by that he means that history is actually written <laughs> by the people who didn't get their heads chopped off, basically. So, you know, um, to sort of to view it, it with these perspectives, I think is probably very helpful. And to allow, I mean, I, I'm again, speaking from my own perspective, to make a work that can be reinterpreted, you know, and, and, and reborn. Uh, and, and not to sort of, um, not to um, just sort of say like a monolithic truth, this is the thing, you know, but to allow it to be renewed and reinterpreted and kind of given a new life, that's the trick. I don't have the answer to that, <laughs> but um, it's, it's uh, I think, relevant perhaps. There were similarities with, with teaching and sort of te thinking sort of pedagogically about the classroom these days that yes, you've got stuff to say and you're an educator, but you never know what's going to happen in the class because your students, you think of them as bringing as much to the table as, 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 as you do. Um, and you're trying to sort of break things out and, and bring them in and do workshops and do all sorts of stuff rather than being you know, the sage on the stage from, from the front in, in, in sort of an old way of doing things. And then at the same time, obviously trying to decolonize the curriculum, which is, which is not mm. easy either. So, um, There's one, one point that's jumping to me as well, um, Tonya, to what you just said as well, about how do you, how do you speak to people in their own terms? How do, we, how do we do that? You know, how do you make something relevant to someone who's not from a, an academic background, perhaps, or maybe it has not even finished their schooling. You know, I mean, we're, we're from all walks of life, right? Life is complicated. Um, and I, my, own, my own father, I suspect, didn't finish his schooling. Um, a Hungarian who escaped in 56 with the uprising against the, the Russian kind of, you know, um, quell on the, on the rebellion in, in Hungary. So as a 17 year old, he had a gun in his hand and it was a very different upbringing to, to my very privileged by comparison upbringing where you know, living in Ireland and also in England. But um, my point is um, that um, to communicate, um, um, it's kind of like, it's not a case of dumbing the message down, you know, because that's condescending, right? We could have something really complicated to try to communicate to someone, something nuanced, something in depth, historically or however. 
we don't need to dumb down the message, but I think that the language, that can change. We can communicate using different languages, like you say, Adrian, that um, Douglas seemed to be very aware of and very able to do, that he could flick from one side of the street to the next and speak, you know, read the room, I suppose, is what you're saying, right? And I yeah. think there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that, to read a room, or so to speak, you know, and to kind of, to, to speak with people in their own terms, but keeping, yeah, I, oh, keeping it high, you know, keeping the aim as high as possible as well in, in what we want to try to, to get across. Well, well, and I think there's some folks that do that, you know, very well. So, of course, if you if you think about, say, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's an right. astrophysicist, right, who's who's talking about just just all of this stuff to so old audiences, yeah. Um, and and so so I think there is a way to do it, and I think that um, from what I've seen and, and the, the few conversations I've had, you know, sort of he and I have kind of a, a philosophy that I don't believe in a failure to learn but I do believe in a failure to teach, right? And so right. if you put sort, sort of the, the, the bird in there, you know, we always, sometimes we say, you know, go into a, a room or whatever, assuming good intentions. That's what we're going to do. We're going to assume good intentions. I try to create spaces that assume an intention to learn, okay? You, you may judge folks' motivations, even if folks got quote unquote dragged there, or even if they're come to be suspicious, it is human nature. We have to learn in these environments and some it's, it's for joy and some it's because we're about to be in fight or flight mode. Whatever it is, what, whatever, what, don't judge the door, just find it <laughs> and, and sort of use it, I think, um, in that space. But to your point, and it, and it resonated with what um, I think what Dominique said, when, when, we, when, you, when we say that 90% of communication is nonverbal, we lean into language, but that other 90% is very, very helpful. I think of classes that I generally hated, but the teacher was so fascinated. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to stay in this. There must be something here because he is really enjoying himself kind of up there. And I think part of particularly what we need to do in challenging spaces, challenging conversations, particularly around race, culture, oppression, um, heritage, all those things is we might want to lean a little bit more into the 90%. We might, might want to lean a little bit more so, sort of in that in that space as you sort of showed um, your your work um, around the, the Choctaw donation. It could have been a plaque. I would not have walked all the way up that hill to see a plaque. I, I would not. I would, I mean, I'm a curious type. I want to know about such things. I just Google. I'm not going to walk up the hill. But you've got this amazing thing. This is not a, hey, what is what is the factual point in history? That is, what is that? I'm going up there. It's like giant feathers. I, I want to know what, what this is about. That was that was using the 90%. Then I get up there. So if we get the, the 10%, uh, and as, as Dominique mentioned, and I also wanted to ask uh, you, Dominique, about as you're you're thinking about the exhibition that you're you're doing now and what we're talking about, you know, Douglas lived for a really long time. And most people have their favorite five years or so. Right. And so that's kind of what they're what they're bringing to the space. And so as you think about some surprises or even disappointments or whatever that folks may run into, how has your kind of approach been in terms of like preparing for for anything and everything, I guess, that might might the, the type of visitor, the type of public that might come and, and see your space? Well, I think that it actually there's a there's a nice balance here. It's striking between how we approach the exhibition and exactly what you, Alex and Tanya, were just talking about in terms of meeting people where they are, you know, the importance of language, but the shortfalls of language and how else can we convey our point across. Um, one of the things we did in the exhibition is in some ways decenter Douglas. We are interested in the speech he gives beginning in 1869. It has all these ideas about now that we've lost these, you know, 600,000 lives in the Civil War, how do we begin again? What is this country going to look like now and who gets to be included? And Douglas's very radical vision is literally everyone, specifically in the speech he gives called Our Composite Nation, he cites um, if America is truly equal and open to all, if we are living by our founding ideals, then the Chinese who are coming in from the West Coast and are getting such horrific treatment, 
that's almost a test case for do we live up to our ideals? If anyone, if everyone comes here and gets treated equally, then then that that should include them. They should be able to run for office and um, serve on juries and, and and vote. And in 1869, that was a very radical statement. And also a singular statement coming from someone who had spent, you know, the previous 50 years or so specifically fighting against slavery. There are a lot of people in activist spaces who have a very clear vision of what they're trying to do, what they're trying to have end. And Douglas is in the unique position of, he was an abolitionist, slavery is abolished. He could go sit down somewhere and, you know, enjoy his money, enjoy his legacy, I'm done. And he instead says, great, that's a great start ending slavery. Thanks for doing it. Now, what about open borders? Let's get, let's, let's get this uh, um, uh, next goal met. And so um, that vision is so important, but if we just stuck to Douglas, it wouldn't reach everyone. So in each section mm -hmm. of the exhibition, we feature accompanying stories, many of whom never met Douglas, never interacted with him in any way, but shared a vision at the same time of, okay, if we're in open America, if we believe in the liberties we espouse, I as a Mormon woman should be able to participate in, in plural marriage. You know, your constitution says religious liberty. I'm going to push you to still um, side with the side of liberty, even when it makes you uncomfortable, even when you think I would never do that or that's not something I believe in. But do you have the right to tell your neighbor that they can't? And so we talk about mo Muslim women and we talk about the Algonquin out on Eastern Long Island and their religious practices as a way to say there are so many people pushing towards their vision and engaging different tactics. Douglas is such a ringing and clear example of this, but by demonstrating how he's not alone, we're actually making a stronger mm. case. I hope, I hope it's successful to say this is how change is made, that we have incredible people who have lived, you know, exceptional lives. And we also have them joining a chorus of other voices who are also trying to make change. And how that relates to this idea of meeting people where they are and accessibility is, I have to say, putting it together an exhibition from conception to completion, one of the biggest takeaways you're left with is just you need your colleagues. There's so many things our graphic designer can do or ideas they can come up with, I'll never get to. You can put it's here somewhere, you know, David Blight's 700 page biography of, of Douglas in front of me. That's my weekend sorted. I'm having a great time. Language and text and ideas is where I can sit all day, every day. But I need someone who's a graphic designer to say, mm -hmm. actually, the silhouette is going to do a stronger job than that quote will. Let's sacrifice 200 words of text to put in a compelling object, right? And so you need that team. You need our family programs. I had a meeting with uh, Maggie, our family programs coordinator, who says, great job in the exhibition, full of stuff. I need you to pick two items for us to focus on, because when we have a gallery full of eighth graders... They're only attention span wise, you know, uh, uh, developmentally, they're going to get to two. So you have to pick two items to tell the story. And I was like, it's hard enough picking a dozen. But that idea that you can't, one person can't get it all done. The very idea of expertise is only going to hurt you if your goal is to reach people and to reach people successfully. Uh, expertise isn't going to get you there. Having a team of people who are all caring about that final goal, who are bringing their own perspectives and talents to the table is the only way you can even approach successfully. Here's a story that many people have an entry point for, that many people can access, that many people can have some kind of takeaway, even if they're not going to pass the Frederick Douglass history quiz at the end of the exhibition, even if they just come away with a little bit of a changed, different perspective or a new piece of information they didn't have before then, um, expertise is not going to get that goal accomplished. Uh, teamwork, um, shared authority, um, and, and lots of communication from beginning to end, both from people within your institution and outside, um, is the only way it happens. And so, while I think when most of us visualize like a curator and an expert, it's one kind of standalone person, you know, uh, Adrian used the sage on the stage, but um, I'm as convinced as ever as the only way it gets done is if you take as diverse a group as possible and you make sure they're all participating and heard and engaged. Um, and that's the only way it gets done. 
Well, everybody, thank you so much. I, I, we could talk about this for a day, couldn't we? But I, I, I guess I'm kind of in charge and I have to wrap things up. I'm also going to head off and do my Douglas Week 5K, my sanctuary runner sort of 5K thing here as well. So mind and body, right? Nice. Yeah, so it's healthy. One so. of my favorite museum objects of all time is that uh, Frederick Douglass's National Park site. You can go see his dumbbells. And that just makes him such a real person. So the yeah. mind and body thing is very much in keeping with Douglas, who was a man who cared about his fitness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you mm -hmm. so much, everybody. That was a wonderful conversation. Um, hopefully we can we can do this again sometime. This is this is this is great. So um, I'm going to get down to uh, I'm going to get down to Charleston. I'm going to get to New York. I'm going to track you down, Alex, and some of your your fantastic artwork too. So um, thank you. Can I so just much, can I quickly add one little footnote? Um, I discovered uh, a great article in the Guardian, I think it is, um, by Gary Young, Y O U N G E. And it's, it's why every single statue should come down. This is, this is <laughs> yep. Amazing, amazing article. Um, just talk about statues in particular, statuary, you know, of a person, you know, uh, like, like Colson, the, the slave owner. And he just goes through it so, so well. And how, you know, the likes of Confederate statuary being raised like not immediately after the Civil War was lost, you know, by the South. Um, like it, the statues only emerged sort of years afterwards, you know, with a sort of not a, not a very clear history on, on, on what they were celebrating. Um, you know, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't about slavery, you know, that they were celebrating there. Um, there was something else going on. Uh, he's, he, he writes very eloquently um, just about all of that and how public spaces are, um, you know, being contested around the world. And um, yeah, it's a very relevant article to, to this, this chat that we've been having. So um, for, I was very happy to be involved. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. So I think we're done. Uh, we're still live right now on YouTube, but in a second we won't be. So thank you everybody for, for tuning in.